I work primarily right now on the Channel Islands, which are a series of eight offshore islands um, located between Point Conception and San Diego, so primarily off the coast of the Los Angeles and Santa Barbara area. It's a beautiful Mediterranean climate. I've worked primarily on the Northern Channel Islands, which are part of Channel Islands National Park. Because they're a national park, there are no cities or towns or, or really very much development of any kind on the islands. Primarily what I'm focused on is understanding how people in the past interacted with and had an influence on the environments in which they were living. So one of the questions might be, how did people you know, have an impact in the past on the nearshore inner tidal in which they were gathering shellfish? Or how did they have an impact on the seals and sea lions that lived and bred on the beaches nearby? One of the main projects I'm working on is dealing with human fishing strategies and the nature of local kelp forest ecosystems. And kelp forests are these, you now they're kind of like a big forest under the sea full of marine life. Um, and they're regulated by a variety of different organisms. They may be host you know, hundreds of different fishes and shellfish and marine mammals, but it's just a couple different organisms that influence and, and really you know, control the structure of that. In these cases, it's sea otters and uh, sea urchins and abalones, and then in California, a type of fish called a sheephead, and then also a lobster. Sea urchins and abalones, they tend to eat kelp, whereas the other organisms, the fish and the, the sea otters, they eat urchins and abalones. And in a healthy kelp forest, what will happen is, is urchins and abalones will be kept, their populations will be kept down by these other predators. And so they'll be relegated to cracks and rocks and eating primarily drift kelp, and the kelp can continue to grow. Um, what happens when these things get out of check, though, say if a sea otter gets overhunted, what happens in those cases is sea urchins and sea otters can just explode, in, or sea urchins and abalones rather can just explode in abundance. And then all of a sudden you get what are called urchin barrens, they're like deserts under the sea. So these old forests of kelp just get depleted and it's a, a much more diminished environment. Now we're exploring this issue by looking at the different types of organisms because we get these things in archaeological sites. We get sea urchins, we get sea otters, and we want to understand, well, did, could people have overhunted sea otters in the past perhaps and, and caused an, an ancient urchin barren? Now we've explored that over the last five or six years, but one thing we've never really adequately dealt with is the role of the fish that I mentioned, the sheephead. They're pretty big, they can be this large, they're very stark looking, they have um, two black stripes and a red stripe down the middle. Um, they actually change sex in the middle of their lives. They go from females to males, um, and they have these gigantic teeth on them. This is a sheephead premaxilla from a pretty large fish, and you can see some of the teeth coming off of it. This would be in the upper part of the, the, the jaw structure. You can flip it over and see that they've got all these small little teeth on the side in here to crunch up the different types of shellfish, especially the sea urchins that they eat. But these fish are, are really important because they help maintain this kelp forest. And so what we've been trying to investigate, did ancient people, the Native Americans who lived on these islands, did they heavily fish for sheephead? And if they did, does that change through time? And did they maybe reduce the numbers of, fish head, of sheephead in some, some areas? And if so, did that maybe cause some localized urchin barrens or help cause it if they're also reducing um, otters in those places. Um, in my own work, I think it's really important to try and increase the relevance of archaeology, something that I think a lot of people unfortunately would view as an esoteric discipline. You know, archaeology is something where we go out and just collect things and we get pots and pretty artifacts and we put them in museums and we tell a story and at the end of the day everybody leaves like, wow, that was neat, you know, the Maya, interesting and it kind of fizzles out of your mind. Well, we, we have a much more to say about that. You know, this is a field, after all, that could, you know, tell us about the origins of agriculture and domestication to the rise of states and complex social hierarchies to the origins of writing. You know, all these things that make us human. 